Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Cuomo, Dean of the Arts and Humanities here at Montgomery County Community College, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2017 Richard K. Bennett Lectureship for Peace and Social Justice, featuring civil rights and social justice advocate Latifa Simon. This annual lecture series is the result of the generous gifts of Louisa and Richard Bennett. They established this program to bring social justice concerns to the forefront and increase awareness and understanding of these issues for both our students and for the community. Richard Bennett devoted his life to work in the areas of peace and justice. He was an integral part of the William Penn Foundation for 31 years, serving in various capacities, including executive director. At Montgomery County Community College, he served as a member of the college's foundation board of directors. In 1981, the William Penn Foundation established the Richard K. Bennett Distinguished Lectureship at Montgomery County Community College. And now, it is my great honor to introduce today's guest, Latifa Simon, a nationally recognized advocate for civil rights and racial justice. Latifa has more than 20 years of executive experience advancing opportunities for communities of color and low-income communities. As a leader in her field, Latifa shows by example that solutions to significant problems often begin with one person who is willing to act. Her passion for supporting low-income young women and her advocacy for juvenile and criminal justice reform began at the Center for Young Women's Development in San Francisco, California. At age 19, Latifa served as the executive director for the center, now called the Young Women's Freedom Center, for 11 years, age 19. Working with District Attorney Kamala Harris, Latifa led the creation of San Francisco's first reentry services division with Back on Track, an advocacy program for young adults charged with low-level felony drug sales. In 2009, she served as the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area, where she revamped the 40-year-old organization's structure and started the Second Chance Legal Services Clinic. In 2011, she served as the program director for the Rosenberg Foundation in California, where she managed grants to support advocacy in the areas of criminal justice reform, immigrants' rights, low-wage workers' rights, and civic engagement. In August 2016, she was appointed president of the Akinadi Foundation, a charitable group that funds community projects in the San Francisco Bay Area. Latifa has received numerous awards for her work, including the MacArthur Genius Fellowship and the Jefferson Award for Extraordinary Public Service. She is the youngest woman ever to receive the MacArthur Grant. She was named California Woman of the Year by the California State Assembly and has also been recognized by the Ford Foundation, the National Organization for Women, Lifetime Television, and O Magazine. In 2016, Latifa was appointed by the governor to the, state, to the California State University's Board of Trustees and was elected in November 2016 to serve District 7 on the Bay Area Rapid Transit District Board of Directors. Latifa studied social entrepreneurship at Stanford University and public policy at Mills College. She is the mother of two daughters. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Latifa Simon today to Montgomery County Community College as our speaker for the annual Bennett Lecture on Peace and Social Justice. Welcome, Latifa. She's awesome. She makes me sound a lot more important than I am. Um, can everyone hear me? Do you have good sound? What a beautiful group. Can I just say, I walked on this campus today and I said these folks who teach here, who do administration here, and folks who are studying here are extremely lucky. Community colleges of the United States are in danger, right? And so to walk on a campus as diverse and as beautiful 
Um, and a campus that is willing to bring me here with my crazy left ideas. I just want to thank you all so much, so much. <laughs> um, so there's this chair here. So part of it, I want to feel like Oprah, but then my activist side wants me to sort of engage and be in a conversation with you all. So we're going to do a little bit of both. And the way that this 50 minutes is going to go, I'm going to hopefully talk for like 45 minutes. It's a long time to talk without water. And then we're going to have a conversation. Because actually, I'm coming here right, with some experiences. But the experiences collectively in this audience uh, really triumph, I believe, everything that I'm going to say today. My intention here is to share a few stories. And I was asked to talk about micro-interventions to violence. And I said, well, wow, OK, well. That's, it, it's, this is an academic institution, so it's super loaded with academic nuances. And as I sought to prepare for this talk, I went back 20 years of this blessed life and activism and organizing, and I said I have a few stories to share of how real, everyday people can take on public systems. Let me tell those stories. And then we'll have a conversation. The way that I think about sharing with folks is to be a completely open book, especially in the, she made it sound like I had way more jobs than I do. But I have like, I've had like five jobs in my whole life, and I'm 40. But in these opportunities, I've actually seen so much. So I want to thank my sponsors, our sponsors, the sponsors of folks who brought me here. And I want to get right into those stories. So like I said, I'm 40, and I know I look 21. Okay, I know. <laughs> no, I actually have a 21-year-old daughter. As a teen mom, my daughter, her name is Amina Ortiz. And like many of you, I went to a high school that was racially and economically diverse, and I fell in love with a young man named Chris Ortiz, first generation Salvadorian, but was raised around black and Latino folks, and we fell in love and we had a baby, both working class and, in fact, really didn't see ourselves articulating into university. We had Amina. It felt like seconds after Amina came into the world, I was alone and in public housing. But a year prior to her birth, something amazing happened to me. After being in and out of high school, working full-time jobs and then coming back because I knew I was smart, I found an institution that was willing to hire me to work with other young women who, like myself, had grown up, grown up poor, had been in communities of deep violence, deep drug addiction and incarceration, to work with other young women in the underground street economy. And I know that that phrase, for some, is a little jarring. All over the country, there are young women, not by their own volition are working in enslavement on the streets of our country, and they're being bought and sold. Some now say trafficked. There are also young women who are very central in the drug economy in San Francisco and in Oakland. And there was a young academic named Rachel Pfeffer. She's still here on this earth. And part of her dissertation was to think about ways in which girls who were out of sight and out of mind could actually come together using the carrot of employment, well-paid employment, and train them in ethnography, and in interviewing, and in data, and talk to other young women who had no voice and no place. And then hopefully that data could be brought together with the voices of those young women who no one had listened to, girls like me, and challenge public policy. So I was out doing street outreach on the streets, even pregnant with Amina, barely achieving a high school diploma, but on, literally on my knees every single day with other young women who had nothing and nowhere to go, but they had the resiliency to tell their stories about how they survived the night before. And after years of meeting and working with 13 and 14 and 15-year-old girls, white and Latina and African-American and Asian, 
who for whatever reason, so many reasons, have been failed by the institutions that were set up to take care of them, first being their families, second being social services, third, prison industrial complex. I was clear that I wanted to be a part of an institution that was like an underground railroad. I saw the deep violence of pimps and johns and of police who weren't trained well, who weren't trained well, and their impacts on young people without power. So at 19, shortly after I had Amina, I took on the position of executive director of a then small organization, that organization, the Center for Young Women's Development. And I tell this story about the center, not about my career ascension, but about what we were able to do when our founder transitioned out, understanding that the power of this institution would only be heightened when the most deeply affected could actually organize and develop its infrastructure. So we did it. Barely again with high school diplomas. Nobody had a computer at home. We had the hacker. Who's an English teacher? <laughs> we had a few grammar books. And there was an organization called the Foundation Center. And we would go in the morning and we would look for grant opportunities. Some of us had pink hair and piercings in our nose. Some were straight, some were queer. I always had a little snuggly or a stroller. And we would learn about grant opportunities. And we would sit all day and all night, once a week, and we would tell our stories, and we would develop goals and objectives, and we would learn Excel and QuickBooks. And within two years, we quadrupled that $250,000 budget. And in my 11 years at the Center for Young Women's Development, we had hired over 500 young women to be researchers, ethnographers, outreach workers, policy advocates. Every single week, we pushed at the Board of Supervisors around not only our stories, but then our policy prescriptions. You all asked me to give you examples of ways in which regular people could shift the culture of violence in our country. Well, I'll tell you, when we began, and again, it was 2021 at the time, we got clearance to start working inside with young women in prisons and in jails. And again, mostly young women who had committed and were incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. Violence has been emplaced on them in the street economy and in the drug economy. We were doing what we called political education using a Frarian construct. We had young women, again, girls training young women. We were trained by, like many of the folks in this audience, academics, right? doctors, theorists, yoga practitioners, even before yoga was cool to the mainstream. And we would go into the prisons and the jails, and in this story, in Juvenile Hall, we were training young women on the history of the lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer movement in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, understanding and knowing while there had been different lived experiences, but we wanted the young women to understand that struggle is struggle. And from this curriculum, and having folks understand what happened in San Francisco, it was actually led by a black transgender woman, we learned that young women in Juvenile Hall were, who were suspected of being gay or lesbian or transgender were asked to dress and shower alone. And me, as a straight young woman, clearly hearing the voices of these young women who were in the custody of adults, mostly because they had been violated, were continually being violated right, and segregated. So what did we do? We partnered with a young law firm of young lawyers who not only said that they were, these were human rights abuses, but that we should be working to get some people fired. And we would be working to then get people trained in how to deal with young people who had been given to the state to raise. We brought hundreds of young women, hundreds of young women who had these stories to the Juvenile Probation Commission meetings each month. From those stories, not only did we fire the ombudsman and make sure that every single 
institution, an individual that was required to take care of children in the San Francisco County had to receive 250 hours of training on how to work and love on children who may be different than themselves, we learned that the stories only continued that young women, and this is not the 60s, 70s, or 80s, or even 90s, that young women who were incarcerated while pregnant, who didn't have a place to go, so they stayed in jail, who then gave birth, their babies were taken away from them at birth, and they were shackled during labor and delivery in San Francisco County. I hate to tell you, this practice is actually still going on all over this country, only three years ago, the Department of Corrections on the federal level just banned the practice of shackling pregnant and delivering moms. But for children, many raped, but many also who had the self-determination to, to get pregnant, right or not, were shackled during their delivery. We brought in the United States Association of Obstetrics, and these, again, girls, none of us had college degrees, we picked up phones, and we halted that practice in San Francisco, and then we developed a young woman's and young mother's bill of rights for all young women who were in systems. My time at the Center for Young Women's Development taught me that regardless of the violence depicted on those at the margins, we, those who had privilege in space and institution, had the responsibility to develop frameworks for folks to fight back because all these young women were asking for was a little bit of dignity, was a little bit of dignity. Now, it's been almost 20 years since some of those amazing, wonderful campaigns where we brought girls together from the streets and from the prisons. We brought academics and physicians and policymakers together. That organization has led over 15 campaigns since and has been peer-run since my departure meaning that girls most affected have been the ones balancing the books, pushing for the audits, and creating amazing employment opportunities. So what I learned from my time at the Center for Young Women's Development, not only did it save my life and allow me to go to college and expect the same from other young women and break down this misconception that because our parents were locked up or because we grew up in crack houses or because our intellect had been challenged in the third and fourth and fifth grade and because we had nothing, many of us didn't have homes or desks or backpacks to study, that we were capable of running a successful enterprise that was about our own freedom. That the employees of the Center for Young Women's Development, all under 24, most of us with records as young people, we were in the juvenile and criminal justice system, most of us with babies, most of us, people that not only society, but that our family members and folks who are supposed to take care of us would shake their heads at and disgust. We were creating pathways out of poverty for so many. When now Senator Kamala Harris, I'm so proud of her as a US Senator, when she called me, and said, Latifa, I want you to come over and bring some of that center magic over to the district attorney's office. She had just got elected to be the district attorney. And for me, having spent most of my life, and that it was like not a long life, it was like 26 years, but it felt really long, <laughs> challenging in my city a law enforcement system that had not caught up with the human rights ascensions in the United States. There was so much that was happening all over the country, and yet police-involved shootings were still on the rise. Young men and women who were arrested and convicted of low-level drug addiction and sales were still experiencing over nine to 12 months in county jail awaiting trial. And on the flip side, women and men who were experiencing domestic violence saw their abusers let out within 72 hours. We knew that the district attorney, or in some states we call them the state attorney, hadn't figured out how to balance that beautiful woman, that blind justice scale. But Kamala asked me, my jail, she said, are full of young men and young women under the age of 30 and at that time, DOJ in Washington said, we're gonna place this war on drugs and make it actually really real, really real. So if you are caught,
with five grams of crack cocaine, which is a devastating drug. It's devastated my family. My family will never be the same because of this drug. I want to be clear. She said folks are rotting away, and we know why this drug war continues, because folks don't want to look holistically at the opportunities that are there. So I can't believe I quit my job, my home, the Center for Young Women's Development, and went to the district attorney's office to work for the man. But the man had five-inch heels and was a Jamaican and East Indian. <laughs> One of the most amazing political figures of our time. I worked under her for five years, four and a half years, very closely, and on the back of an envelope, literally, we developed what we believe continues to be a model that is an anecdote for the drug war. Every single day, young men and women were arrested. I'm going to tell you how this worked. Were arrested for drug sales in our community, and every community has one of these spaces and places. It was called the Tenderloin, which is rapid drugs, crime, trafficking, folks who are deeply in sorrow without opportunity. These young people were selling dope in the communities where folks look like their mothers and fathers. We learned after going through every single charging sheet, and we would bring these young people in, and I would go up and see them in the county jail, and I would ask, what would it take? What would it take for you to commit to a life of peace? Like, we don't ask folks that. We immediately, as a society, in our construct, when we look at young and black Latino men, we see the potentiality of them as monsters instead of peaceful actors and amazing fathers. The same to young women. Time after time after time after time, in the beginning and when we were doing research for the Back on Track program, what would it take, Henry? What would it take, Charlize? What would it take, Johnny? And I took this data, again, that I learned as a student of ethnography, and we coded it on an Excel spreadsheet. And what we saw, it was jobs, jobs, jobs. I don't have daycare. I am completely traumatized when they came and took my father when I was three. I am completely disheartened to know that I was in 13 foster homes and no one cared and I'm left on my own and I tried to go to City College, but I had no place to stay in the summer. I mean, I had stories that were so clear, clear enough for us to develop a programmatic and policy prescription of what to do to deal with low-level, what war felony offenses that would have sent these young people to jail for 20 years. How much does it cost to incarcerate a young, nonviolent, felony drug offender in the United States in a state prison? Anybody? It depends on the state, but the average is $48,000 per year. Now, when that young man and young woman gets out at 55, what opportunities will they have to be men and women of peace? Very few. You can't work. You sure can't get financial aid. So we knew that the prescriptions of how to create safe communities from our local and federal government didn't actually make sense. No one asked the folks who were committing crimes what would get them to stop. Jobs, folks wanted jobs. Folks wanted child care. Folks wanted dental care. Folks wanted to be treated like a human being. And many of, of the naysayers, and believe me, when our program hit the papers and we started doing really well, folks would say, well, well why would you invest? I want a job, so I have to commit a crime and get a job? And we said, people would say the same thing when I was working with girls on the streets, but we said, if you don't care about the humanity of this human being and their families and seven generations to come, I am quite sure you can understand the economic argument that we are going to save the state over a half a million dollars by, guess what, sticking with this person over the course of the year. Check this out. When you get into law enforcement, what I learned, and I was in law enforcement for almost five years, there's a lot of discretion and leverage there. Having a young person 
commit to working, and then coming to court that is outside of the jail setting, we got volunteer judges who were real judges, to have a court check-in every week. And of course, if you didn't do what you were supposed to do, you're back on your own. But if you committed to a court plan that you designed, that you designed, not only after 12 months would we erase the arrests, so it would never appear on your record, we would drop the felony. Gone, done. You're back to being someone in society that has absolutely a direct pathway to justice, to peace, to civility. But the way that you get that is not on your own. Nobody in this audience is completely on your own. Even if you believe it's so, I promise you, there are folks who will fight for you. Why not in the justice system? Why not people who have, in fact, broken a social contract? It is more important, I believe, to invest at those folks, in those folks, right at that chronicle, right at that point where their story is very clear. Less than 10% of the folks that we worked with over the course of eight years in the program before Kamala became the Attorney General of the State of California, the program is still going on, were rearrested. So let me tell you why that's significant. Everyone here, for the most part, is in the academic setting. If you got a 70 every single time on a test, you would be average. Well, our prison system has a recidivism rate of about 70%, meaning that everybody who gets out of that system, give or take that 30%, come back within a year. A year, a year, a year. So that means only 30% don't. What if you got a 30 on a test? The year after year after year after year. But unlike this school, your 30% was good enough for continuous state investment. Continuous, we're just gonna keep on dropping money into our jails and prison systems. People are not safe, folks are just coming in and out. But we wanted to shift that paradigm, and we did. We knew, and again, not in every instance, but for the low level drug dealer, not the dude who's stacking bricks in big trucks, but for the young man and the young woman who was in foster care all of their lives, who made a bad decision, who was trying to pay a single occupancy resident hotel rent for the week, who decided to sell these evil pebbles to people who looked like his mother, giving him an opportunity prevented us as a program, but also his family and his children from him being locked up. Well, why won't we just fill the prisons? Because when we fill the prisons and people get out, they actually commit violence. Less than 10% of the folks in our program went back to jail. I believe deeply in my heart in creating a program where we address the social, the political, I'm gonna say that again, the social, the political, the economic, and the historic reasons why folks who are struggling are in the conditions that they're in, we get to the root cause. So no, I didn't set up a court program where it was just about jobs and it was just about hygiene and you looking like a smart young man. I deeply wanted folks to understand the timeline of the drug war. I wanted folks to understand reconstruction in this country. I wanted folks to understand redlining in this country. And of course, we made sure to talk about the 15 African Americans who were in the state Senate at the time, but I really wanted to make sure that folks understood that they themselves were not monsters. They were capable, like in the Judeo-Christian values that many of us hold, capable of deep redemption. Having moved forward into my new world where I actually get to fund and support folks who want to think about racialized harmony and who want to think about breaking unjust laws, I said it. <laughs> I said it, like when black folks stood at lunch counters and they weren't supposed to, though they were breaking unjust laws, right? Like when folks took over the airports all across the country, protesting a Muslim ban, I supported those organizations with real money because those were unjust laws that were deeply un-American. In fact, when we think about micro interventions to violence, my mentors and professors 
have pushed me to think about what causes violence, both on a community level here, on a university level, in the home, and globally, it's misunderstanding and lack of education and the inability to have conversations about things that are hard. Like, we are still at that point, not only here in Montgomery, but all over the country, where it's hard for us to have conversations that are hard. And I am so enthused that the folks in this campus have taken this very difficult path in education, because you learn how to agree to disagree. You learn how to place power and place in one theme. I want to tell you one more story. I talked to you about the center. I talked to you about back on track. Those are great, amazing stories. But I want to talk to you something that's a little bit more uncomfortable about where we are right now. You want to have that conversation? There are many different political views in the audience, and I understand that. Are there? You just never know. <laughs> it's OK. That's what the beauty of democracy is. We can disagree, even on some of the most fundamental values, without being killed. I was sitting with a, an amazing friend and mentor who's a Colombian activist and who's been here organizing churches around the values of social justice and immigration reform. She's going back to Colombia, and she told me, she said, you know, at least here, I didn't have to worry about my head being chopped off. I say that with clarity, because I sighed and I gasped when she said it. With my own privilege of being born here, never thinking of, I mean, I laid my body down, the folks around me, we have taken arrests, we have gotten, you know, beat up by police during protests, but the fear of assassination has never been a part of my lexicon as an activist and organizer. I say that because it's time to get serious. We still live in a democracy, although some may say it's extremely being tainted. We have this amazing opportunity as folk, as citizens of the world, as folks who deeply care about, if not anybody else, our own families or our own survival, to mirror nations who are struggling in the outside, not just in the inside, like South Africa. South Africa is trying to get serious. They're struggling. But in visiting the beautiful country and sitting with young college activists like yourself, they told me, in America, y'all don't talk about race first. You're scared of it. You're scared. It's a stain on your nation, and you don't talk about it. Everyone's supposed to be, like, the same. <laughs> I said, you're right. There is, there's, there's some uncomfortability in talking about race and class and ethnicity in every conversation, a young brother told me, who is East Indian, but a native of South Africa, he said, in countries where colonialism is at the core, how do you not? How do you not celebrate and talk about and discuss difference? It's almost like ignoring people and their journeys and their complexities and their beauties. How do you get past a violent society if you can't recognize the humanity and experience of a people? It made me think. No country, no city, no home is perfect. But that idea of consistently acknowledging who we are in the circles that we surround ourselves in was a noble thought. How do we think about micro-interventions to stop hate? It's certainly not sweeping differences under the rug. How do we think about equality? People love talking about diversity, but are scared to talk about race, right? How, in this time, do we think about equality? I know 
that I've been challenged on this in ways that I didn't expect since November. For folks who are deeply, deeply struggling with the idea of immigrant integration, I ask you to have the historical, the social, the political, and the economic conversations with the person who you know or may not know, but you must find them that doesn't have papers and is trying so desperately to live in their humanity. We have to figure out how to get serious because I told you earlier, what saved my life wasn't just a job, but it was a frarian understanding of the world that I will never be free unless the person standing next to me is as free. It was so difficult for me to move past in rooms that were extremely, extremely hostile. And some of those rooms were black rooms around immigrant integration, around immigration reform. And so as a new elected overseeing our train system in the Bay Area. Has anybody ever been on BART in the Bay Area? It's like 100 miles, like it's a, like a big system. I introduced to our board and to the public that I wanted our train system to be a sanctuary train system. Sanctuary transit, I believe that, like Rosa believed, who wasn't just a tired old woman who got off work and just sat down and didn't get up for the white man. No, she was a trained organizer, let me just be clear, trained by the Highlander Center, a senior investigator for the NAACP. She knew, like I do, like many of you know, transportation and transit access are the key to any economy. And when you, in this instance, open up the gates and open up the doors for federal authorities to racially profile people without knowing if they have papers or not, that's not the kind of system I want to live in. I'd rather shut it down. We called for a sanctuary and transit policy, and the hate mail that I got made my skin even thicker. Though this is clear that there is a population of people who need people with privilege, and I have what I call uterine privilege. I was born here. Like, I don't think about my head getting cut off or talking to you today. I absolutely need, as I've stood up for young black and Latino men in prison, who should be out taking care of their children, as I stood up because it was my responsibility for young women who had been trafficked but yet had the self-determination to do any and all things, this is a moment where it's important to call out state violence. It's important, and I would actually go further and retort that it is critical for those of us who have visited, and some of you know what I mean, the graveyards of slaughtered Jews, the graveyards, like I do my grandmother every year, segregated graveyards in Arkansas, we know that there are laws that were developed and adjudicated that took away the humanity of real people. As we think about place and space, as we think about economy and race, I would ask all of us right now as a global community, because actually in this audience I see we represent four sides of the world, four directions, that we think of our intersectional obligation race and class and political orientation, who we love and how we love, and the journeys that we will go, our children will go, the walls that will be constructed. So yes, it's important to think about micro-interventions where we get young boys jobs in the union so that they're too tired to go out at night and cause drama, but it is also important for us in this moment to figure out, do we have what it takes to resist unjust laws? Do we have what it takes as a society, as a community, to stand up and say, not my brother, 
not today? Do we have what it takes to lay our lives on the line? And for many, especially in the collegiate setting, that means turning in all your shit. <laughs> I had to get in one cuss word during this talk. <laughs> I've been really trying the whole time. It means being a scholar. It means getting to the next level so that you have the opportunity and the power to articulate the social and the political, the historic and the economic frameworks of the people that you're fighting for, even if it's your daughter. Throughout the next four to eight years, it's also important that we think about history. Even in the last administration, over two million people were deported. It's record numbers. In the last administration, we saw the proliferation of prisons rise to historic rates. Even in the last administration, children in this country went to bed hungry and young women were still bought and sold on our streets. Mercenaries were across the world dropping bombs on children. I am in no way saying that things were great in October of 2016. The opportunity that we have now is to envision something so amazing and work towards that. Acknowledging that elections matter, both locally and nationally, and acknowledging that student voice, in fact, can and has been and will be what will drive the nation forward. And every progressive and successful social justice movement in this country, it has been students, especially those with everything to lose, with children, with debt, those in foreclosure, those with a song in their hearts, right, who stood in squares and demanded that things change. I cannot wait to hear what Montgomery does. It's a complicated, complicated system. It's an expensive system. But its students represent the heart of America, very American, meaning undocumented mothers, folks with three jobs, folks who are barely hanging on, folks who might not even make it back this semester. Those are the folks who not only we fight for, those are the folks like the girls who ran and who are running the Center for Young Women's Development should be on the front lines of that fight. Thank you so much, and I'm willing to take a lot of questions. <laughs> so someone is supposed to, we have microphones, and um, I believe one of your staff members or faculty or you just can come up, and I would love to answer your questions. I think we have a good amount of time. Sure. I can hear you, and I'll repeat it. I thought that was such a perfect question. And so I wonder, for our faculty, staff, and for our students here, what questions, is there a question we should ask of each other, mm -hmm. do you think, knowing what you know about us? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of questions that I think that when you're in, I, so I was in the community college for seven years. I took all these classes that sounded interesting but never got me what I needed, but I do think it made me a better meaning mean transfer. I could have got a PhD in seven years, right? But I will never, ever regret that time that I spent in the community colleges in San Francisco because I actually had teachers that once I got to university, they did ask different questions. I remember I got evicted one day. I mean, well, I was getting evicted, but the day of my eviction, um, we were hurrying, and I was again a young mom, and hurrying to get stuff out. It was an owner move in, and my criminal justice, it was like policies of, or administrative of, administration of criminal justice. It was one of those classes that weren't transfer, transferable, but I didn't know, but I loved it. It gave me a nomenclature around justice. Um, he asked me what was the dust 
on my jacket. And I broke down in tears because he saw me. He saw me not as just someone in a seat. He saw me that some days I brought in my baby. Now, this is not really the answer to your question, but there's something about the community colleges that, and I've been to now thousands of them, that is so different. The professors, the staff, they've seen students on their knees, on their knees, literally, figuratively, and spiritually just trying to get through. I think it is asking each other, no, how are you really doing? And you might not have an answer. Sometimes somebody might tell you like, how wow, they really are, and there aren't the resources. But as many, if we keep asking, what is it going to take for you to pass this class? Those were the kinds of questions that made me feel human, right? What is it going to take for you to turn in a paper on time? And these were the struggles that I was going through, not because I didn't want to be a great student. The life that I was living precluded me from a couple of things. And like the men and women that I work for, from being in my absolute greatness and for taking the space that I needed to say exactly what I need. Let me remind you of something. There are people in this world, in this country, in this city, and maybe even a few on this campus who demand, and I know professors, you know exactly the students that I'm talking about, demand everything they need when they need it. They feel a certain amount of clarity about where they are. If they need an extension, they're not going to wait for the last minute. They look at the syllabus, I can't do this. I'm going to need this and this. I want professors to push entitlement on their students, because absolutely, students in the community college must feel entitled to their basic human right, and that's an education. And an education oftentimes on, and this is controversial, on your terms. Because knowing what we know for working class, working class people to obtain even just two degree, I'm excuse me, two years, you're going to not only have a different kind of quality of life, you're going to be able to pay your bills easier. The likelihood that your children are going to go to university, the likelihood that you know what they're going to be going through when they're filling out applications, I mean, I can go on and on. How are you doing? What is it going to take? What do we need to do? Because there are, there's those students that you know, many of them are here because they could be doing anything else. There's just that something. And I'm so happy and proud that I listened to the professors or the counselors who said, no, Latifah, just, just, okay, just withdraw. But you got to take this class again next year. Things will be easier next year. Um, I mean, I'm almost in tears just thinking about my own journey. But the professor, the counselor, the financial aid supervisor, oftentimes may be the only person in that young person or even adult's life who's giving them an ounce of humanity. You can actually do this. Because after, you have to go to a job at a factory or you're a receptionist at the dentist's office, and no one's seeing you. But here, people are seeing your soul. They're seeing your, your intellect, the potentiality of what you can do. I got Fs in high school um, because I was always working full time. Full time, as a child. Um, ask about the humanity of the students. And in turn, students also need to check in with their professors. Some of the lowest paid people in the sector work at the community college. Shocking. And they're being recruited for other institutions, but they stay. They stay here for this mission of educating working class people who they know have the ability to go on, whether it's a PhD and or being in a job that they just, just really deeply love. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi, Latifa. Thank you very much for doing this, and thank you for your life and your work. Um, I have actually two different questions. Mm -hmm. One is um, kind of for a friend who doesn't have ex experience. She's from a Mennonite church. They're actually mm -hmm. very progressive. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't have experience with the African-American population. And she's like, how do I change that? How do I get to know people so that, you know, we understand people better and their cultures better so that maybe we don't have the prejudice? And are there any suggestions that you would have for people to get to know other people, you know, specifically African-American, um, 
so that they can understand each other. Okay, that was your first question. What's your second? All right, my second is more to do with my daughter who, um, we are fortunately, I mean, I grew up working class, um, somewhat um, uh, segregated, somewhat not. Mm -hmm. um, so I've thankfully given my daughters a lot of experience. Um, and my one daughter is looking into an international relations. Now she's looking to go to um, law school and she wants to work for maybe the, the ACLU or, you know, a lot of what's been going on has been very hopeful for her. Um, she's looking at internships right now and one is the Carter Foundation. And I guess um, being, going in from the bottom level, um, one of the things that's like coding information about um, ISIS propaganda or something like mm -hmm. that. What, how do you suggest or, or how do people deal with understanding that maybe everything you do helps the bigger picture? That is such a great question. And um, I, if I, if I wrote that book, um, I would actually have really nice shoes. <laughs> if I really knew the answer. But I, so these two questions are actually extremely central. And I, I might not get the second question completely right because I'm trying to figure that out myself. But I am often asked all the time with different audiences, you know, whether, and, and now that, that question is actually, it's, it's shifting because folks are asking, how do I get involved with immigrant groups? But there's a, there is this age old question in this country um, around race and integration. My, there, so I have two suggestions and they may not be popular. There are a number of organizations that I am learning from right now that are white run, that are very much about training white folks to do anti-racist work in their own communities, right? And that is extremely important, right? Extremely important for us to begin challenging these notions about what you see on TV. And we have our Dean of Communications here who should do like a lecture right after this about how these images actually start, you know, vis-a-vis -vis birth of the nation, gone with the wind, what you see on the news. If it bleeds, it leads, right? Um, there are very few stories that are even coming out from local news about what's happening on this campus, right, with low-income students or African-American students who are organizing um, or Latino students or Asian American students that are coming together. So what we see is actually what we believe, right? Even the crime data, the FBI crime data can be uh, uh, alluded to, to to retort racist notions about who we are. Segregation actually was policy. It was policy and unjust laws do need to be broken. I believe whether, it, I mean, I spent a lot of time going to churches that are Korean churches. I believe Korean, Latino, white churches. I, I, I know a lot about Judaism and I'm not Jewish. It is a very important value that I surround myself with the people around me. Because if we not only want to like, you know, develop a better nomenclature of how other people live, but if we want justice, I need my brothers and sisters, and so I'm not talking just about African Americans, I need my brothers and sisters who will bleed with me in the world um, for us to speak the same language. I need to be able to sing the songs at your mother's funeral that you sing. I need to be able to hold your hand in the darkest of moments. I need to be able to go to your holy land. So I would really encourage your friend, your communities that are struggling with this issue. Brian Stevenson is a scholar. Read uh, Just Mercy. Has anybody read Just Mercy? Amazing. One of the four tenets of Just Mercy, he talks about proximity. We cannot make change if we are not close to what we want to make change. So I'm not saying change black people, I'm saying racism, I'm saying uh, lack of inclusion. We need to be close to the issues that we want uh, uh, to move. If you haven't, I always tell folks, if you haven't, if you don't know where your strawberries come from, I would suggest calling a farm and asking to pick for a day. So you can see, even here in this state, migrant workers, there are no work laws for six-year-old Salvadorian kids who are picking potatoes. So then when you talk about, when we think about 
the folks who go through life or death just to get past our border, and they're paid under minimum wage, and there's no protections for their children, and they must work until they're raided. Why anybody would want to come here? They must be facing devastating persecution. Exactly what's written on the wall, right, of the Statue of Liberty. So proximity to me, whatever I don't understand, I have to be uh, in line step to get proximate with, with the issue. Because if I just relied on what my parents taught me, and they were amazing activists, but even th their summaries are oftentimes limited based on what their experiences were. Um, and every mosque, in the country on Friday, there's this amazing thing called Juma. And Juma is open to everyone. You don't have to know how to pray. You know, every mosque, I guarantee you, I promise, it's like every church on Sunday at 10 o'clock, same thing. You don't have to know Arabic, you don't have to learn how to pray, you don't even have to be covered up necessarily. Go see that beauty, those songs to God. So it's African American, I believe it's also Asian American. Have you ever sat down and had lunch, if you're not an Asian American, with an Asian American family? Especially folks who have been exiles from communist China because they wanted to be dentists or doctors and their parents were murdered and they come here with little to nothing. And of course they want their children to be amazing. Right? So spending my life and complete what I, you know, I mean, there's, there's politics around this and not the kind of like electoral politics, but what we call um, multinational or internationalist living. I, here in this country, you have this beauty of having an international life. Um, even in places where there are not a ton of people who don't look like you, find them and with your heart become a part of the community. It'll enrich your soul. And, and that's, I believe, why college must be free. <laughs> because it is one of the only places where you can really deeply learn about the world. You can deeply study the world and you can have people really hold you accountable for what you haven't seen and experienced. It's the only place because within your high school, your elementary school, those spaces are oftentimes extremely proximate to how you were raised what the nomenclature and the values of what your parents or your family have taught you is only when you get out of that comfort zone where you can see and feel and taste what the world is really like. What's unfortunate, and because both of my parents are from the South and I spent a lot of time there, I have found that the people in the South, many people in the South, in the Midwest, and especially in the South, they are so proximate to their own beliefs. So proximate to their own beliefs. Let's not be that. Are there any other questions? Great question, by the way, and thank you for being fierce enough to ask it, because again, these are some of the uncomfortable conversations that in this moment we must have. There is never a dumb question. And what I would also say before the next person, I, I, mean, I, I did kind of come from San Francisco, so it'd be good to have just like one more question. Um, mm -hmm. What's so cool about your question is you pushed me to go beyond purity politics, right? Meaning, if you're totally not like really radical, it's not cool. Or if you work at Starbucks, how are you gonna be a part of the revolution? Like, I can't take that anymore, right? Or all the women at the Women's March were just like middle class white women. I mean, like, I'm so done, right? With that, you know why? It's important to have critique. It's important to have critique, but it is also extremely important in time of, of shifting political economy, a time of uncertainty for everyone to be searching for knowledge and place and community. And if we can't even get to that space, my God, we're in trouble. So I want people to ask really uncomfortable questions and questions that might not necessarily be super race conscious and developed. Because how do we develop race consciousness? How do we develop class consciousness? We ask questions that are in our hearts. We ask questions that have been in our spirits for years, but we've been in places that have been so unsafe that we've never been able to have, you know, that sort of what I call the critical conversation. So, sister, thank you. Any more questions? There's a microphone in the, uh, in the aisle, sir, if you'd like to come up. 
I'm sorry, I just got here. I waited for an hour without moving on the turnpike. <laughs> oh, no. But I'm here now. Yay. And I just wanted to ask if, um, maybe this has been asked already, um, uh, in light of Academy Awards So White mm -hmm. last year, and then this year, mm -hmm. the um, number of, uh, the amount of recognition for uh, black artists um, mm -hmm. and others, uh, um, do, what, can you comment on that? And uh, I mean, I see it as a positive change. It is so not a, a developed thought, but you know, I'm sitting here, so I'll comment on the Oscars. Uh, why not, right, <laughs> you ask. Um, so, you know, being pretty close to Hollywood and knowing now in, in my life, a lot of folks who are in the film industry, um, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the Academy. The Academy is also led by an African-American woman. Um, I mean, I didn't watch the Oscars, but I did see Moonlight. Did anybody see Moonlight? Ooh, go Montgomery, go Montgomery. <laughs> My daughter saw it, again, and she is, she's mixed race, like I said before, so I always automatically think, like, she's just gonna get everything because she was raised by her father and I, again, we were, we were teen parents, so we didn't raise her together. But I'm still working on her critical consciousness while I'm working on mine. She's like, I didn't get it. Um, I just didn't get it. I got it because I grew up when everyone was around me like that beautiful young man and everybody was on crack, everybody. And I also grew up in a community called the Fillmore, which is juxtaposed to the Castro, one of the world's what I believe most precious LGBT communities historically. And I was also in the midst of the AIDS crisis and the crack epidemic within six blocks of each other as a child. When I saw that movie and knowing friends who have, like close friends, dear friends, who have killed themselves and have moved away because of the degradation that they experienced for being queer, and we use that term in my community as a, 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 a term of affirmation, by the way. I just want to be clear. Um, but they humanized this young man in a way and gave him complexity that I oftentimes, with no film critique credentials, but seeing that folks are not given that kind of complexities um, who have that background on film. So, you know, whether the reaction was to make up for lost times at the Oscars. I, I think culture um, in, in communities of struggle is extremely important to tell stories. It is Women's History Month. We only got a few more days. But speaking of that, you know, there are, right, right <laughs> Women's History Month. Um, and that's kind of why I'm here. But I took the TVs out of my house which I love TV, you know, like it's like the best thing in the world. But I took it out of the house because I have a five-year-old, I'm a widow, my husband that I met eight years ago, passed away three years ago of leukemia. And so I really wanted to develop a, a focus in my home. So of course I got Netflix, right? Like on the phone. <laughs> and I started researching women like Fannie Lou Hamer, and we're going back to culture, Fannie Lou Hamer, who many didn't, don't know, and I recently learned that most of her salary was paid for by university and by SNCC, right, with Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and by activists, because her culture, her voice, brought so much love and intensity and courage to young activists as they were fighting, right, for, for racialized harmony and for voting rights in this country. Um, Culture is oftentimes what leads public policy. It's what leads community change. When we shift narratives, and we shift narratives through experiences like Moonlight, or uh, Fences, or just beautiful artwork that we see, that it, like the butterfly, the migration butterfly. Sometimes our consciousness needs something a little bit different than what we're seeing and reading on TV. So I am so happy, personally, about Moonlight. I'm so happy that we have this experience, but it doesn't provide erasure, right, for over 100 years of really bad racialized and sexist and homophobic media. Um, we, I guess, have to create our own. And the beauty of 
um, the raw product, I should say, of, um, of, the mo of many movements that we are trying to create is new communications, ways in which we express ourselves through words and through art. Um, but yay, go Oscars. You know, we'll see what happens next year. <laughs> So I um, have a question. First of all, thank you very much for being here and sharing your journey with us. So you mentioned earlier around how we're comfortable and we'll talk about diversity, mm -hmm. but not race, and yeah. we're comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to probe you a little bit and ask you to share with us, how would you direct Montgomery and moving past conversations around diversity of which are comfortable mm -hmm. and to move more into conversations in discussing race? Yeah which are oftentimes uncomfortable, specifically around microaggressions, yes, yeah. that I think um, what they are and how they impact our students, staff, and faculty here at Montgomery County Community College. Yes, so this is a very good question, and it's a question that um, I've actually asked to my mentors, right? Like, we can say it, but how do you do it? If diversity is truly a value, I think it's important to spell out the value, what, is the, what does that mean? To have a diverse space, what does that mean and what are the complications and opportunities that come with that? Diversity, what does it mean? Because do, I have a diverse family, I have a five-year-old and a 21-year-old and a 40-year-old who looks 21, right? <laughs> no, I love that joke, my daughter told me I look like her so I just keep saying it. Um, but in all seriousness, I would ask, I, I ask smaller institutions, this is a larger institution, but to have a couple of canons, right? And Just Mercy is one that, you know, if I had a million dollars, I would buy a gazillion copies of it or have Brian Stevenson actually come here. Um, it's important to be able to have text, especially in an educational environment, that pushes the conversation around race. Just Mercy for me right now is this because, again, he's such a noted um, historian and scholar and uh, master of jurisprudence, is, is to dig deeper in, into what mercy really means in this country, um, how we got there, why it's so hard to talk about race. Um, so having a canon that you're sharing amongst your colleagues and your students, again, it's again, one of those visions and goals, and no one has the resources. But you know, there are ways in which even the first and second chapter gives you of just mercy a lot of what we need. But defining diversity, its values, and challenging each other. So when you say diversity, what do you mean? Just really, what do you mean? And when we say people of color, what do you mean? And who's being lost in that? When we say low-income students, what are we saying? How many students go are going to bed hungry? And let's keep the statistics. I'm on the Board of Trustees for the CSU, and it's 23 universities, the biggest university system in, in the world, in the country, but I think kind of the world. But we started keeping good data on students who use the food pantry. I mean, it's ridiculous that in this country we have to have a food pantry at a public university, but it is the real. But who? You know, you just type your information, and just your student ID, we can tell a lot from that. And it seems e evasive initially, but when we describe to students, we need to understand demography and how getting to this school and staying in this school determines who you are and where you come from. We are not there as a country yet. I mean, I'll give you another example. In San Francisco, where I'm from, everyone thinks it's the West Coast. Oh my God, they have so much money. We do have a $9 billion budget. It's a city, it's seven by seven, $9 billion. Like Twitter's there, you know, like Snapchat and Spotify and Pandora, like it's all there. And yet, if you come to San Francisco, you will see mostly African-American folks within the homelessness population literally dying in their own urine. I kid you not. And so the director of homelessness under the mayor's office, we were having a conversation a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, I'm almost thinking that being African American is a predetermination of you being homeless. And I said, absolutely it is. We make up 3% of the population, 70% of the homeless population. You have to talk about race. And so if we want to have a candy-coated conversation about race and class, we can do that. It's much easier. No one sweats. Everyone goes home. We have the diversity dinner. Good. But, right, and that's fine, but I believe that our conversations will be richer. When I look at a Samoan sister 
and I say, your trajectory to this country is different than your Eastern Chinese counterpart. I have to talk about race and class and ethnicity. I have to talk about and acknowledge that if you come from Ghana and you come from Mississippi, you have a different lived experience. If you are Irish and versus Jewish versus just Anglo-Saxon, it's not better or worse, they're different. And honestly, if you're going to have a democracy that is flourishing, I can just say that I look past color. But then I can also say, if I want a peaceful society, I realize that's not possible because when there's a stoplight, I go on green. Did you hear that? You get it? You know what I'm saying? You do acknowledge color. You do acknowledge difference. We do acknowledge race. You do see the kind of shoes that that child who's coming into your English class is wearing. You can see that they have no money. You can see that their backpack has been borrowed, right? You see that they don't have books. You can see and know when people are sleeping in their cars. So the level of acknowledgement is first, but the defining of the problem and of the opportunity is important. When you acknowledge that diversity truly is a racialized, inclusive community, then there's a lot of stuff you gotta do. Language access, right, becomes an issue. The issue of historical trauma becomes an issue. The issue of migration becomes an issue and an opportunity. Telling our stories becomes an opportunity. You know, Frary, when he was very focused on teaching rural children, mostly children of African, Brazilian, native descent in Brazil, he came up with this philosophy and, 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 and modality of teaching called social biographies. And he really, it was about young people really deeply telling their stories, but again, with the political, and economic, and historical context, if we were really gonna talk about race and class in ways that were courageous, we would push students, even if they were learning engineering, to start off each semester by telling their peers who they are. I guarantee you, my goal is always to have more babies come out of institutions, right? So it's like, how many people can fall in love, right, in an institution? How do we cross those barriers? How do we create communities, right, where folks feel safe and one? And one, not because we're looking past their differences, but because the differences are so um, provocative. I mean, I want a lot of families coming out of this institution. And the way that it happens is through understanding and clarity. I think it should not be on the black person or the Latino person to teach people about race. I'm like exhausted by it in my life, right? I'm like, oh my God. Um, but we know, I know that is unfortunately my cross to bear because I live race. Like I can't go nowhere. This woman told me and she had a little pink hat and I get it. But like, you're a woman before you're black. And I was like, I kind of wish that was true. <laughs> because when you see me walking down the street, you actually see my black face. It might be different for someone who looked different. Um, and I acknowledge that. And I also know that my gift in this moment is to talk about race. I'm not going to lose my job. I'm the president of my institution. But many people will. Or they'll be called combative or difficult. When you always want to talk about race. <laughs> Yeah, and you talk about it every day at dinner, but I want to talk about it in the open. So, sister, thank you for that question and, and encouraging us to be uncomfortable um, because you know what? Race is being discussed every single day now more than you would want to think on Capitol Hill. Women's rights or lack thereof are being discussed every day as well. Immigrant rights and integration are being discussed, so we can just go about things like nothing's changing, or we can get on top and ahead of these conversations and create institutions that flourish. There is enough research, there's enough that has been written and published, there are enough illuminaries um, that are talking about this stuff. We have all that we need, but unlike making bread, there's really no recipe for justice, right? We haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen in Appalachia poor white folks get the health care that they need, ever. We haven't seen the poor white folks in Appalachia and the richer folks, we haven't seen equity there, 
right? Where the, the folks with a lot of resources are telling the folks in the coal mine with all kind of blood diseases that these are good jobs. I mean, we can be here all day, but I think now, for students more importantly, to be loud and take up this space and to require that the, the, the elders actually open up space for difficult con conversations, but then also follow through. And you are, so thank you. Thank you, Montgomery, for doing this, because it is difficult. Thank you, Latifa. This was a very inspiring um, hour and a half. And I do have one question, speaking of white folks. Um, I'm always battling uh, with the intersection of poverty and race yes. and politics. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that this country has a history of separating the poor on the basis of race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. I see some of that in our student population. Um, and I'm always struggling as director of diversity <laughs> to try to Hi. figure out how to, to show people how much they have in common um, by virtue of class as well as by virtue of the fact that they're students. That's a great question. Thoughts. Well, it's interesting, and I, I know you all have to go because I would keep you all day, is if I was really in the context right now, not an internationalist context, but a context right here, right now, violence means more to me than physical violence, state violence. Violence is classism. It is racism. It's violent. It, is, it, is, it runs through our DNA. You know, it, 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 it does. It is, and when we can't see, and I, again, I spent a lot of time in Appalachia to learn and understand these intersections, especially with white poverty. It's very important to see and understand that lexicon of folks, not all, but many voting against their interests. We know that, and you know, we have a historian here in the audience, that much of that politic was instilled in people around classism as related to race. Right, post-slavery and reconstruct, post-reconstruction and pre-reconstruction and New Deal, and it is it is something that we can rip apart. Because guess what? We're all here, and we're not going anywhere. And our children are going to be loving each other and building a republic. Hopefully, knock on wood, that is better than the one that we left them. I believe that more than ever. I mean, most poor people think they're middle class. Am I right? There's a reason for that, right? There's a reason for that. And so if I have nothing, you guys, I'm speaking to the choir. If I have nothing and I see someone getting a little help, we automatically, automatically have issue. I was raised in the Fillmore in San Francisco, and it was an African-American community, heavily gentrified now. But African-Americans came, I mean, like in mass from Mississippi, from Texas, and from Louisiana. Folks from Louisiana oftentimes had more resources than the folks who came from Louisiana started businesses, partially because they had resources. Um, and many were patois, creole. There was racial divisions then. But what was really interesting, in the Fillmore, why were there so many houses for folks to move into? Well, because the Fillmore was a Japanese community, and it was a middle-class Japanese community, chiropractors, doctors, accountants, teachers. Folks were interned kidnapped from their homes. When they got back, many of those who did survive came back to their homes, not realizing that redevelopment had bought those homes and sold them for a tenth of the price to African-American working and middle class people. So racialized strife, even between those two groups, is still in the fabric in, in my town. Those just two groups. So it is exactly what you're asking, what you're purporting. It is, it is race and class, and I, again, I am a student of these issues as well, so don't have the answers. But what I'm finding and what I know and what I'm reading um, is that there's no way to just call it out. And I saw some of the class offerings under uh, sociology and uh, political science here. There's some really great classes. And I think that there are ways in this moment where some of those classes can be open classes in here. Right? where folks could just come and listen to more lectures, where you don't have to bring folks externally. There's some amazing, amazing texts that you all are offering. I mean, the website is phenomenal. This really is one of, this is a jewel in the nation, this college. Um, and I would encourage 
the faculty and the staff to begin having courageous conversations, um, but also figure out in those conversations how you can take care of one another. Because you will unearth, as we do with our children when we're bringing them in the programs that I'm a part of, out of their trauma of incarceration, foster care, uh, mass incarceration, all these things, when we bring the reality and the realness, right, outside of our guts, and we put it on the table, it's out, and it's hurtful, and it's painful. So you have to figure out how to take care of each other. But it's for the benefit of your students to create what is like an underground railroad, right? Like a place of freedom where people can take refuge from all the horrible stuff that they experience outside from poor white students to a student who came here to work with no papers. They all need a refuge. And the community colleges, I believe, is like pretty much it outside of our faith-based institutions. This is a place where people who outside of their own group think can come together to challenge deep injustices. So I've talked to you all to death. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really mean what I say, that Montgomery is a beautiful place. You all are stellar. The students are magnificent. The graduation and transfer rates are amazing. And this can and, and is a beacon. And continue that work. And thanks for having me. Thank you. And please uh, stay for our reception right in the lobby. Thank you.